So welcome along, good evening, uh, good afternoon if you're in the States or elsewhere, or good morning even. Uh, this is um, In Conservation Web. It's been going for nearly a year now, 10 months, and I've had a range of really interesting people on, um, but I'm really quite excited tonight um, to have Lucy Jones, who is an awarded writer. I will actually explain more about her in a second, but before I do, I just wanted to firstly welcome you Lucy, and how are you today? Hi David, thanks so much for having me and lovely to see everybody. Um, nice to be with you all tonight. Um, I'm okay, yeah, I'm fine. Um, I got out for a walk earlier and I saw lots of snowdrops and that was um, pretty wonderful, so yeah. Are you talking about the plant snowdrops, the flower, or actual snowdrops? Yeah, the, the plants, we've had, we've had kind of... Um, swirls of snowflakes here in Hampshire but no, none of the snow has really landed um, but I live next to a kind of urban cemetery and it's just filled with snowdrops um, and I, I find it really um, quite therapeutic to just go and watch look at them and spend time with them. Oh lovely. Um, Lucy and I actually have never physically met as far as I know but we have been in correspondence with each other for the last at least couple of years. I think you contacted me a couple of years ago when you were writing a piece for the Guardian or something maybe yeah and yeah and for the for this book yeah we talked about we were talking that's about right. nature and mental health yeah that's right that's right and of course we are sort of loosely if not actually quite tightly tightly if that's the right word but closely following the the course of this book tonight losing Eden which if you haven't read I think you, sh you need to I mean I'll tell you more about that in a second but let me just quickly run through um, who Lucy is for those who uh, are unfamiliar. She's a writer and a journalist, and you're based in Hampshire in England. Uh, you previously worked at the New Musical Express, Enemy, which I used to read as a youngster. Is it still going? Yeah, it is, yeah. Wow. Um, and the Daily Telegraph, and you're, you're writing um, on culture, science, and nature has been published in... Uh, BBC Earth, BBC Wildlife Magazine, The Guardian Newspaper, Time, and The New Statesman. Um, your first book, which is called Foxes Unearthed, which I think is a great title, by the way, um, was celebrated for its brave and bold, honest account of our relationship with the fox. And it won the Society of Authors Roger Deacon Award in 2016, which is fantastic. And your latest book, which is behind your on your shoulder, is called Losing... Eden, and I believe the paperback comes out next week, is it, you say? It's in there two, about two weeks on the 27th. Okay, yeah. on the 27th, great. And it was a book of the year in the Telegraph and the Times, and has been long listed for the Wainwright Prize as well. Tonight we're going to be talking about, broadly, about nature and mental well-being, um, a subject that we need to keep talking about until it's part of the general conversation because it still is not part really. I mean, I remember um, during the week, someone put on Twitter, um, I'm sick of talking about mental health, just suck it up and get on with it. And I was quite surprised by anyone even saying something like that. It was just uh, unbelievable. Um, if you haven't read the book, and this is not a plug, but I, I started reading it and it really, I mean, the detail you go into, Lucy, is quite astonishing. Actually, I wasn't prepared for that. I couldn't believe the, the actual, you know, the depth you went into, which we'll talk about a little bit tonight. But it also made me feel very, I mean, it, it, it inspired me, to be honest. And it's not often I say that publicly in front of loads of, loads of Zoomers, but it did inspire me. Um, I was saying earlier to Lucy that I've been sort of doing my work as the urban bird for the last 15 years now, and I've always felt almost in, well, certainly in the beginning, in isolation, thinking about the fact that I'd like to connect people with nature in urban areas, thinking also loosely that that's going to be good for your well-being. Um, now the well-being and being out in the countryside or being out in the open air has become more of a thing. People actually understand that now, I suppose. But you always feel as if you're in isolation and suddenly you come across people, I mean, I have now, who are in the conservation sphere in the, in the sense, but not in my little world. They're actually in other areas 
and you're one of those people who you kind of connect with and then you actually see the stuff that you're writing about and realize actually this is kind of this is the other end of what I'm thinking you know and it kind of joins the dots in many ways so I want to thank you for that because that really was something but anyway before we talk about all of that let's talk about you um because this is about you tell us where you you kind of you know you come from and how you first kind of delved into this world of nature and the mental health thing. Sure, thank you. That was such a lovely introduction. Um, I guess um, I come from, um, well, I grew up in near Windsor, um, just outside of London. And um, I suppose in terms of kind of connecting and engaging with nature, um, I was really lucky that I had grandparents who lived in Scotland who lived kind of in the middle of nowhere. So I'd had I had the opportunity as a child to <clears throat> kind of roam around a bit and and to 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 kind of develop a meaningful connection um, and kind of love for the natural world. And then I think probably similar to quite a lot of people, um, as I went through adolescence and kind of early adulthood. I became interested in other things and my kind of relationship with the natural world w went quite dormant. Um, and that kind of culminated in my twenties with living um, quite a kind of urban indoors life in London, working in music journalism, um, kind of, yeah, working long hours in offices, getting quite stressed out, um, having some kind of mental health problems and, and addiction issues and so on. And the, the kind of the, the genesis of, of losing Eden and the thing which kind of um, catapulted me into this area of research was, um, I suppose, a kind of personal health crisis where um, I went into recovery um, from various things. And um, I found um, just nature. So walking, walking every day on Walthamstow marshes, which I don't know if anyone knows it, but it's a beautiful um, part of northeast London um, with kind of kestrels and water voles and herons and and as I was trying to kind of recover and and live a, a different kind of life um, I found myself drawn to to this open space and I mean it was probably this is about eight or nine years ago now and um, I think i I guess like lots of people I intuited that spending time in, in nature or outdoors was in some way good for you but I was really blown away and kind of um my mind was blown by how powerful it was and how important it was and how you know I'd go out for a walk and I'd come back and I would feel very soothed and kind of feel the swirling self-critical thoughts and brooding seem to have been dampened down um, and and I, I started to wonder um, what was actually happening in my brain and body and mind um, I wanted to kind of drill down into the nuts and bolts and kind of look under the hood as it were and and yeah work out exactly what the, me the mechanism by which connecting with the rest of nature seemed to seemed to alleviate a lot of kind of psychic pain. Um, so I started doing some reading and, and, and researching kind of just because I was personally interested. Um, and I think this was, I mean, yeah, so this was about nine years ago and it was kind of before, um, or maybe there were, there were some GPs starting to kind of prescribe nature therapy and, and ecotherapy as, as a thing has been around for decades, but um, it still felt a bit kind of like there wasn't like these days you might open the paper and you'll see kind of lots of studies about how kind of walking in nature might kind of um, is good for mental health and stuff. But back then it wasn't it wasn't so obvious. So so I started reading and researching and I was so lucky that I just kind of walked into this really exciting and fertile um, and vibrant field of scientific research where. Um, people all over the world and every continent from environmental psychologists to evolutionary biologists from 
um, scientists studying the microbiome um, to, to people studying the, the science of awe, um, neuroscientists, endocrinologists, so many people across the world were trying to answer the same question that I was interested in, um, you know, which was how and why does a connection um, or meaningful engagement with nature seem to make us feel in some way good? Um, so that was the kind of background and the genesis of Losing Eden and, and why, I, why I wanted to write the book and the journey of the book. That's really fascinating. I mean, going back um, to the book, to the beginning of the book, when you talked about your addictions, it was quite interesting how, well, interesting, probably the wrong word, but how you kind of fell to these depths. Um, and then when you kind of pulled yourself out of this hole and you discovered the fact that in being in nature was giving you that buzz, but without any of the after effects and the side, side effects, it was really quite poignant in a way because, you know, being someone who's never had an addiction, I, I, it's hard to actually understand um, what someone goes through and even though, I mean, I've, I had my own bout of depression 15 years ago when I was um, diagnosed as being mildly um, depressed. Knowing how nature made me feel, I wonder, I wonder if it's easy. To, I mean, there can't be just one way it makes you feel. It must be how it is so different for each individual person. I'm finding it hard to actually explain this, but I found it really interesting reading what, what you said, basically, about how you pulled yourself out of this whole situation yeah I think one of the one of the most compelling and interesting um kind of areas of science that I found which relates to the kind of um to what we know about addiction and and that side of things was about um there's an area of the brain called the default mode network which is um the area which uh, is associated with kind of rumination and brooding and a sense of self um and that's something that as, an, as, as addicts often talk about is kind of the obsessive thought patterns and so on. Um, and in studies, um, uh, there's some studies from the University of Berkeley into the kind of science of awe and wonder actually, which is an amazing, an amazing and interesting science, um, which found that kind of <clears throat> connecting with nature actually seemed to reduce activity in that area of the brain. Um, and that was definitely that's definitely something that I could kind of relate to is um, yeah just kind of switching off. Um, and I guess it's something that in the, the addiction world people talk about. It's called addiction FM, and it's kind of the the thoughts which kind of get you into a compulsive patterns of behaviour. But I think it's also something that all of us um, probably experience. You know, thought patterns that we want to break out of or that. Um, that can become kind of compulsive or obsessive. And certainly that's why I, you know, I'm i nine years sober now, but I go to nature still because I, I find it, it can kind of take me out of my, my sense of self or rumination, you know, thought patterns, which can, can be unhelpful. And then it plugs me into something bigger, like um, you know, with the snowdrops today and, um, you know, just kind of connecting with the, the fuse of life and, and yeah, kind of the vastness of of the world um, is is something that yeah I think is quite universally uh, appealing. I guess. Yeah, I mean, one thing that um, I got from the book, and I've got several things, but one of the main things was that nature connects us, I guess, to our past. And there's a couple of things that really kind of made me think when I read them, one is the, when you talked about um, the extinction of experiences, which I think, when I read that, it suddenly, just the penny dropped, and I suddenly thought, that's it. Can you explain to the Zoomers what you mean by that? Because it, I found it, you know, really powerful. Yeah, sure. So this is a phrase um, from the American ecologist Robert Pyle, who's a really great writer and thinker. Um, and he coined this phrase, the extinction of experience, to describe um, <clears throat> the kind of pattern of winnowing um, of experiences that people have kind of with, with the rest of nature, with the rest of the living world through the generations. So, for example, um, my grandmother's 
have a kind of inherent knowledge and lexicon of the natural world. Like they just know the names of the wildflowers and, and the birds and the butterflies and the patterns. Um, and I kind of had grew up, grew up with that, then just kind of having that, that vocabulary. And then my parents um, probably know maybe half of that or, or so on. Or, and then I probably know five to 10% maybe that I've picked up, although I'm trying to kind of learn more and correct that. So the idea of the extinction of experience is that you know, as we continue to become more disconnected and disengaged um, with the rest of life, we, um, we, we just lose you know, the knowledge and the learning and um, you know, the, the, tactical, the tactical experience, the, the sensory experience and so on. Um, so I think that's, it's quite, um, it's a really sad phrase, but um, it's quite a simple and, and pithy way of you know, thinking about where we're headed as a society um, yeah. and why we need to change course. Because it's interesting, I mean, using that phrase, but then you also say that, you know, which is quite correct, that we look around us, nature is everywhere in terms of our references, you know, in terms of what we say and what we name our pubs and what we name our streets and words we use to describe things. And it's such a sad thing to think that, you know, kids are growing up not realizing where some of these phrases actually come from. Yeah, well, there was that, um, there was that, that thing when, when they, they took a load of words out of the Oxford Children's Dictionary about 10 years ago, beautiful words and, and the lost words you know, by um, Robert McFarlane and, and Jackie Morris was a response to that. Um, you know, words like conquer and uh, I think kind of Blackberry and Wren and so on. Um, and there was a kind of quite a furore around that. But I think it, in a way it, it kind of was just mirroring what's happening, isn't it? If we don't give kids the opportunities to, to kind of know and, and love the natural world, then those words and those phrases are, are going to become kind of ob obsolete. Um, I, I was very encouraged though with, I visited some forest schools and some outdoor nurseries in my research for Losing Eden and um, there's definitely like a pushback against, against that I think and there is a real, there's so many people doing amazing things trying to kind of reconnect kids with nature and um, you know, and it's funny using the word nature because of course you know, we're, we're nature aren't we? I think that's kind of part of the problem sometimes is the way we separate ourselves um but i guess that's another big big topic why do you think um nature or the the, the sense of being part of nature is so irrelevant to people now um i think there's lots of it's a really interesting question i think there's lots of answers um i suppose the foremost it's because we don't need it in the same way as we did before you know we can kind of get our food easily can't we in the supermarket and um you know we can heat our homes so we're not living kind of in nature as we did for millennia um but then also i guess we live in a in a society and culture with a lot of distractions and you know a hyper consumerist society um where the things that we value uh are kind of more tied to our economic system maybe than the things which are free and outside already. Um, and I suppose there is that kind of, certainly living in an urban area, which I kind of always have done, a sense of nature is just kind of on the margins, isn't it? And we kind of, we like nature as long as it's not kind of in the way or causing us a problem or too messy or, um, you know, too untidy. I think there's a kind of sense of kind of obsession with neatness in urban areas and kind of human dominance, which which is a trend, isn't it? And and then I think the less you see, the less you know, the less the less you can love. Um, and I guess in terms of kind of thinking about it in the context of health and and mental health, um, I, I think psych psychoanalysis and psychology over the last kind of 100 to 200 years has really ignored um, the relationship humans have with the non-human world or the rest of nature. Um, 
apart from Jung, who I, who I write about in News of Eden, none of the major psychoanalytic thinkers have really um, considered that our relationship with our wider environment and the other species we live with might be important. Um, so I get that. I guess that has fed in in some way to how we kind of view view health. Um, yeah, that. What do you think? I'd be interested to know what you think, David. Well, I think um, one of the main bugbears I have is how nature is sold, and I keep. I mean, some of the uh, in conservation with Zoom, regular Zoomers will hear me moan about this quite a lot. But it's how it's sold to people. I mean, I think that it's so sanitized. Um, and so sort of put into an entertainment box that people just grow up thinking, well, that happens over there. It doesn't happen here. You know, if, for example, I mean, I remember there was a stage when I was looking on YouTube at lions and leopards and stuff killing prey, because when you see it on TV, it's, you know, you see the stalk and then you see the lion jump in the back of the wildebeest, then cut. And then there's a nice hygienic shot of the lions eating, not too much blood, you can't see anything. So when I actually watched the uncut versions of stuff that you know people, tourists have filmed and put on YouTube, it was quite shocking at first. Then I realized actually the only reason why it's shocking is because I, I don't see this part of nature which is actually happening all the time. And you go to other countries like in Spain, for example, and you turn on the news and they show you everything. Um, so people grow up having much more of an awareness of nature around them as opposed to in places like here and maybe in the States, maybe in other Western countries where you just don't, you get, it's just so sanitized. Um, so you, you don't build up any affinity to it and you become very distant from it. And I think, you know, especially kind of listening to others and reading your book, you kind of realize that this connection is so important, more important than ways than we in ways that we can never really kind of work out unless you start studying it. I mean, one of the things you talked about was a psychoteratic illnesses, um, which again, maybe you can explain this to the Zoomers because it made me realize that, you know, we really, you know, once you start unplugging yourself, it's like anything, you, you you, you've got a machine and you unplug a couple of plugs, it will still work, but it won't work as much as it should do. And then eventually it comes a point when it suddenly shuts down or something goes seriously wrong. So yeah, can you explain about this whole phenomenon? Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, what you just said was so, um, so astute and it speaks a bit to one of the, one of the key questions I wanted to look at in News of Eden, which was kind of, you know, if people um, if people don't have a connection with the with the rest of nature, is that harmful? You know, are they missing out if you've never had kind of opportunities to to engage with nature? Um, is our kind of innate uh, intrinsic attraction to the love of what of the natural world to, to the natural world, which is often called biophilia, can that can that become dormant? Can that be, um, you know, can that end up just kind of being us evolving out of it? Um, so that was kind of, I was quite interested in that. Anyway, um, yes, yeah, psychoteratic illness. So this is a phrase um, coined by an Australian, I think he calls himself pharmosopher. So he's like, a, he's a farmer and a philosopher. Um, and it means, um, it means kind of, um, psychological mental health conditions illnesses um pain connected with the earth teratic um so examples of that would be um eco anxiety which kind of is becoming more of a common term um climate dread um glenn albrecht himself coined a very poignant word solastalgia um, which means a kind of sense of mourning and a sense of loss um, for a landscape, um, a landscape that you've lost. Um, so he talks about the kind of the farmers in Australia who have, who've lost their farms um, because of the fires and so on. And there's another 
there's another term it's kind of beautiful and very sad um that robin wall kimmerer um the author of braiding sweetgrass coined which is species loneliness um which i think is very powerful and and kind of and speaks to that sense that for the first time in our human history um you know we are very separated from from the northern human world um so the, yeah and i and I, I i write a bit about the kind of increase in eco anxiety in in losing eden and how we're starting to see particularly with communities on the front line of climate change like the climate crisis you know already those obviously um mental health the mental health fallout so as the physical fallout um is being you know it's being um it's, it's being clearly seen um i guess and i think the word i think eco anxiety is quite an interesting phrase because um you know i, I think it i think it's dangerous to kind of pathologize it or 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 see it as a kind of disorder because in fact it seems to me that it's a completely appropriate um response to what's happening <laughs> you know it, it, I think it's it's interesting how we talk about these things, um, but it seems to be quite uh, it's like the the world itself, which is something Glenn Albrecht said, the sit the situation we're in, the systems we live in, um, that are disordered, not people being anxious about it. You know. You talk in the book about um, experiments that certain psychologists and other people have done. Um, almost comparing rural communities with with urban communities, and you talked about um, the uh, is it the Amish people in America? Um, is it that right? Is that the right thing, Amish? Yeah, uh, Amish or Amish? I'm Amish, not sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, compared with the other guys, which I can't remember their names. Hot and, right. And how the Amish people, you know, they're farmed using tractors, and they were out in the field using their hands basically, whereas the other guys were all high tech you know, and sort of not really getting their hands dirty um, and how this kind of chemical imbalance in their brains was less so with the people, the Amish working in the rural areas, which is quite interesting, really, because does, does, that, does that tell us that once and for all, does that tell us that being in nature, getting your hands dirty, eating a bit of soil now and again as a kid, it's going to help you in the long run than to live a sanitized life with your iPhone and your TV. Yeah, so this um, this research I found really fascinating, and compelling, because when I first came across this idea that there's a mycobacteria called M. vacci, which is found in the soil, um, that can have antidepressant-like effects, I really thought that sounds really unlikely and kind of woo, as it were. Um, I think I read it on like a Facebook parenting group or something. Um, about about yeah M, M, M Vaki it's called but then as I as I dug into the to the research um and talked to a couple of the kind of um the scientists who study it and and looked at this the Amish and Hutterite um literature and work um it became clear that yeah there is uh lots of evidence that this particular bacteria which is found in soil um in studies does um does increase serotonin, which um, obviously is the kind of main hormone involved in our mental health. Um, and the Amish and Hutterite um, comparison was interesting. Like you said, the Amish live still a very rural way of farming. Um, the children run in and out of the barns. They don't have any kind of high tech machinery. Um, whereas the Hutterites are kind of in air conditioned tractors. The children aren't kind of running around because it's dangerous with all the machinery. And what they found with is um, uh, the the Hutterites had much higher levels of inflammation, um, and the Amish had much lower levels of inflammation. Um, and which they they argue and they conclude was to do with their exposure to to different types of bacteria, including M. vacci, in the environments they live in. Um, and so, yeah, one of the one of the scientists I spoke to said, you know, this leaves us wondering if we shouldn't all be spending more time in the dirt. And uh, so I'd noticed that my little my baby daughter at the time would just naturally put soil in her mouth. Um, 
and and Graham Rook, one of one of the microbiologists, said that's something that babies do kind of across the world. Um, and obviously, you have to be a bit careful, but in a way, it's kind of absence of of exposure to these friendly bacteria, um, which is which is more of a problem than uh, the fear, which um, I heard a lot in particularly my research for my my childhood chapter of you know children getting dirty and getting too muddy and, and being around soil um you know actually we evolved with these old friends as they're called um you know this bacteria we've lived we've lived alongside uh for, millen for millions of years um so yeah i i i i i find that i i kind of wanted to work out why i got such a buzz after gardening um and that was obviously maybe one of the reasons um, yeah. You know, you, you talk about some very interesting sort of research um, theories, you know, ideas. Can they ever actually happen in terms of can, what, how close are we to getting people to understand that, you know, we do need to be more plugged in? Mm, such a good question. Um, I really think that in the last in the last couple couple of years, um, I think there I think there is a shift, and I don't think I'm being falsely optimistic. Um, but as the as the literature and the scientific evidence becomes more robust and more um, kind of there's more empirical studies, you know, and, and it's kind of like a snowball effect. All of these people just proving and it's kind of crazy isn't it that we even need the proof um you know that we need nature for our we need a relationship with nature for our for, for our well-being for good mental health even like there was a there's a great study um published at the end of last year from leipzig i think germany which found that um uh i can't remember what the phrase was but it was something like background nature so um, street trees in an urban area um, was associated with lower numbers of depressed uh, um, antidepressant pre prescriptions um, and it was kind of um, oh god what was the word um, it, was, it was it was about the fact that these weren't people who were like wanting to climb trees on the weekend or you know were like obsessed with trees it was just it was having this kind of background effect even if if they were just kind of there and I think yeah, as the evidence mounts, we are beginning to see um, changes in the way people talk about health and there's more GPs prescribing, social prescribing, and nature therapy. I've definitely had been written to a lot more in the last year from people kind of setting up or training in horticultural therapy or you know, wanting to set up um, you know, ways of incorporating um, kind of yeah nature therapy and um i think that the the changes will really happen when we see things like urban design um you know how we design our our cities and our towns um looking at barriers to nature connection so um socioeconomic systemic racism the barriers by which people can't access the restorative properties of nature um even in law so one of the i tried to end the book and a kind of optimistic positive note and one of the areas that i find really exciting and is it, it is happening happening in lots of other countries is this this idea of giving nature or you know a river or a wood um another being another non-human being a uh, legal personhood giving them kind of power in a course of law to kind of defend themselves as, as a person would have. Um, and it, it's an idea called earth jurisprudence. And I think the UN has actually kind of taken it on board, so it's not completely wild. But um, I think that when we start to see changes in kind of policy, education, urban design, you know, that kind of those those areas, that's when that's when there'll be more of a shift. Um, I see it though. I do see it. There's lots of reasons to feel positive. Um, 
but I mean, we could go down the politics route, I guess. <laughs> but um, there's probably, obviously, there's massive issues. We need top down systemic yeah. political change. And we need, you know, there's so much short term thinking, isn't there, and short term goals. And essentially, if our, if our um, focus is economic growth, how can how can you balance that with with the rest of with the rest of nature um yeah i'm, I'm going to take an unusual step now and get someone on to ask a question my good friend amy has asked a really good question and amy do you want to step on stage amy jane bear was one of my guests in fact she was on last week i think um was it it seems so so, so not long ago but anyway can you can you can you come on amy Hi, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Hello, Amy. How are you? Hi. Hi, David. Hi, Lucy. Hello. Hi. Um, so I would, um, obviously, as someone who's experienced firsthand the, the benefits, the mental health benefits of, of access to nature um, and, and seeing how society, we're sort of getting used to this idea that nature is, is good for us and people might be recognising for themselves that that is something that they would, they would want. Um, we also need to tackle the barriers, as you were just saying, that there might be for people's engagement, people's access to nature. Um, and while mental health benefits might be recognised as a public good in the in the, the, the sort of brave new world that we're entering now, where landowners might be subsidised for granting access to, to green space, um, at the same time we've got this um, prospect of of losing access through the criminalisation of trespass and, and restricted right to roam. Um, and in, in areas, particularly in, in areas like Greenbelt, which are close to where most people live. Um, so I wondered if you had a view on that, that, that proposal to criminalise trespass um, and on the right to roam campaign generally. Yeah, thank you, Amy. It's really nice to see you. Um, I think the criminalisation of trespass is very frightening. Um, and I can and I support the right to roam campaign. Um, I had like uh, an experience experience over the last couple of years where I have this, there's this river really close to my house um, which uh, I've been kind of going to with my young family and, and swimming in um, over the last four or so years and it became like personally a really important place um, when I was recovering from postnatal depression. Um, really like really important place I love this river and I had no idea that I wasn't actually allowed to swim in it. Um, it was, uh, it's privately owned and, and leased, leased to a fish, an angling club. And that kind of got me, um, got me kind of wanting to learn more about access to land and land rights. And I really didn't know, didn't know much at all. I didn't know that we have only 95%, access to 95% of of the land, I think, and 98% of, of rivers and waterways. And it just, anyway, I was, I was swinging this river and, and we were told to leave and we were in a different river the next week and my, my kind of three-year-old was fishing for minnows and we were again told to leave. Um, and where I live, it's a really urban area of like a lot of, about 100,000 people with one river that goes out and the whole thing is privately owned. So I realised that actually there's this one river for this, this whole town and we're not allowed onto it at all. Um, and so that the children of this town don't have the right to kind of go and look at minnows or look for dragonflies or to have that experience of, you know, paddling and obviously being respectful to everything, but, you know, falling in love with our rivers and waterways. Um, and I just had, I just had no idea how, how little we'd, how little access we had. I found the book of Trespass by Nick Hayes very, um, very helpful in kind of uh, understanding the history of that. Um, and that's one of the reasons I do support the Right to Roam campaign. Um, I think that you know, there are a lot of complexities to this, um, the subject, and especially in the last year, you know, there's, there are lots of people worried about um, the honeypot areas and, um, you know, the fact the countryside code hasn't really been funded enough in order to, you know, for people to understand how you know, ways of looking after the landscape. Um, 
but I think that lack of access is is just crucial in um, in giving people the opportunity to fall in love with the the living world. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I support I, I support it, and I think you know they do it in Scotland, they do it in Finland. There's lots of examples of where there is the right to roam and you know, people are respectful and so on. Um, so yeah. Thank you, Amy, for that question. It's interesting, the right to roam, because I remember being on the Faroe Islands uh, once birding, and I was walking down a one-horse um, town road, looking in people's back gardens rather sheepishly, looking at their bushes. And then this big guy, really big guy, I think his name was Thor or something like that, came out and said, what are you doing? And I said, uh, I'm just looking for, he said, come in my garden. And when you finished, come in for a cup of tea, which I thought was quite nice. And it made me feel very good. That's um, so nice. It was, yeah. Um, because you're allowed to be in people's gardens over there. You, that's the complete right to roam. Um, now, we're, we're obviously going through a world pandemic and many populations around the world are in some form of lockdown or restriction. And, you know, there's been a lot said about people realizing that nature's around and obviously some people have actually kind of taken to it and, and ran with it but do you think that um in the long term this is going to change things do you think people's mindsets are going to be changed or do you think that come one day when everyone's inoculated and everyone thinks it's safe to come out um we'll just go back and forget the stuff we went through hmm. I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously have my personal biases because I find, I find it just non-negotiably effective. Um, you know, I do have periods of, of I, I say this in the book, um, you know, I have had periods of depression. Where I, I have gone into nature and not felt anything. And I think it's important to not, you know, set it up as something that's always going to make everyone feel better because everyone's complex. Everyone's minds are complex. Nature is complex, you know saying that um i guess kind of from the point of view of of, of kind of the, the research i've looked at and, and the science um the way being in a natural environment can affect the the brain and the body um it's so it's so myriad and, and varied it's like a kind of club sandwich you've got you know, the effect on the brain um You've got the effect on the nervous system, kind of balancing the parasympathetic with the sympathetic nervous system. You've got things like the smell of the earth after it's rained, petrichor, which is associated with um, uh, tr uh, activity in the brain associated with calmness and relaxation. Um, you know, you've got smells, you've got touch, you've got fractals, uh, you've got bird song, you've got color, you've got, um, awe and wonder um you've got kind of soft fascination which is a phrase i love um from attention restoration theory which is one of the leading kind of nature and mental health theories which basically says that it, a natural environment just gives us a chance to kind of switch off the cognitive mind and and kind of our busy brains and just kind of give ourselves a kind of break and you know kind of come back to ourselves um, You've got lower rumination and brooding. You've got, you know, the fact that a natural environment in the natural environment we recover from stress more quickly and more completely than we would in a built environment. Um, there's so many more to say, but I think that because of that, I would hope that you know anyone who may have experienced that for the first time in the last year, um, it's not something you can kind of maybe maybe easily forget. Saying that, I think one of the things the pandemic has done um, is shone a light on, on the kind of inequality of access to nature, um, you know, and the fact the way that our, our kind of our, our town, cities, even countryside are, are kind of designed, uh, the dominance of cars, traffic, um, you know, some affluent areas being more likely to have high quality green space and so on, all the different barriers. Um, you know, I think it, it has, it, yeah, it's really kind of illuminated that inequality of access to the natural world. And that in conjunction with the, 
um, the growing field of kind of literature and science um, proving unequivocally why we need nature for our mental health and well-being, um, I'm hoping can't be forgotten. You know, we've all kind of, um, I guess we can imagine how, you know, shielding in a flat with no access to, to, to outside space and not even a view onto a tree, that's not easy. Um, that's not a kind of sustainable, you know, for our sanity. So I'm, I'm hoping that, yeah, that those, those learnings from this year may be brought into kind of, yeah, society-wide change. Um, yeah, I think, you know, there, were, there has been a renaissance of love for the natural world in the last year. There has been, people have kind of clung to it, haven't they? Um, and I think the data bears that out. Um, you know, there was the People in Nature survey, which found that in the UK anyway, um, people who visited natural spaces were more likely to, to report feeling happy. Um, you know, everyone in my, on my road, everyone was planting in their front garden, um, kind of vegetables and so on. Um, so yeah, I hope, I really hope so. I think, I think it, it's something, it's something we, we, even if we've forgotten and we overlook it, that, that we do need, um, I certainly feel that. The UK is quite, I suppose, a, a classist society, really. Do you think that what you write about and what you're talking about now is something that's more likely to be taken up by the middle classes than by working class people? I think that, um, I guess, like we know that middle class and more affluent areas tend to have privilege in terms of the nature that they can access, you know, being able to an, afford to kind of access natural areas. Um, but I think that it's really important and imperative that um, because of all this, this evidence that we now know, you know, there's, there's a responsibility for people who kind of run our, our parks, our urban areas, even like, you know, um, kind of small, small urban parks, which, which may be kind of nearer to kind of more disadvantaged areas. Those, firstly, that they are, the, lo the needs of the local community are taken into account. So kind of more mindful and more creative programming looking at ways of involving um, different communities, you know, in offering opportunities to access nature, but also that we just cram all the space in urban areas we can with more life, you know? I've been trying to rewild like this field behind our house. And it's just this like bare field. And I do live in a middle-class area, but I'm really close to the most disadvantaged areas of the town I live in which have, it's very, um, there's not much green space at all. Anyway, so there's this kind of field and I've been trying to kind of reworld it in the last year with my neighbours and we're getting there. We just had some trees put in and had some bulbs and some wild flowers and bat boxes and bird boxes are next. But it, it's interesting to me how you know, it all has to be in the public interest. Um, and it, it's kind of a, a fight in a way. Like we've been lucky that we've been really supported by our councillors, but you know, I look to other examples of urban design where, yeah, they're just packing kind of any vacant lots. And, and the evidence suggests that if you plant up vacant lots and you regenerate kind of urban space, uh, it has measurable impacts on, on population health, um, you know, and, and will affect everyone. It's not fair for, for Kind of working class or certain populations to to walk to school down streets where there's no trees or to play in playgrounds where there's no there's no other species or kind of you know, logs to climb and so on. Um, I think that I suppose to answer your question, I think education is very important and in terms of kind of addressing the the class uh, inequalities. Because if all children, for example, at primary school in the UK had 
uh, the ability to to go outside in a wild and wild play and and so on and, and you know feel a spider on their hands or you know watch a watch a butterfly um, and smell kind of the fresh air and touch a leaf or a tree then you know that would level the the playing field I think it would make it much fairer and I think it's it's there's definitely like a lot of people doing really great work in that area it's not you know we don't prioritize that for children yet um I think that would probably be the key to to yeah making things more equal yeah I mean I, what I, do you I, think? I totally agree with you in that you know it's access to areas that can change something in in your mind and how you perceive the world but that is possible as you hinted even in the middle of an urban area when it comes to town planning and doing things in a way that makes it work. I mean, I, I've been to several, I mean, in my career as a urban bird, I've been to maybe 340 different cities around the world. So I think I hold the record, actually, I should be in a Guinness Book of Records for birding in all these different cities. And I always make a point of going right into the middle of the cities and some are really depressing of this concrete gray, but then there's others where even sometimes by accident, there's a little oasis and there's quite a lot of things that could, could be of interest. And I remember going to Cleveland in, U, in Ohio in the US and uh, I went to this school, um, which was predominantly, in fact, if not all Afro-American and they were poor kids. I mean, some of them, you know, basically their feed, the food was actually at school. They didn't have any food at home, but they were next to this um, area, which, um, was basically a disused some kind of mining pit which they've managed to kind of make into this little sort of nature reserve stroke place to run around in and that was great because even me you know even I'm there as a visitor and I'm like oh look there's you know because there was lots of stuff to see and it's really I was getting excited about it um, so it's possible to instead of having or expecting people to go to nature, you can bring it to them or at least open their eyes so they can then see that it's actually, it's here in front of me around us. And that's the job, the likes of us and others um, in this room and elsewhere have to do to try and convince people that actually, you know, we need to, it starts here. It starts on the doorstep. It actually starts inside the house, you know, and we do it, as you say, from top to bottom, but also bottom to top. So both kind of meet each other in the end. So there, yeah, that's how I feel about it. It's a really complicated subject, which we could talk about all night. What do your, I mean, you, you've, you've obviously, do you think you've changed a lot um, as a person since your dark days? Or are you essentially the same person, but just seeing things more clearly now? Ooh, wow. That's the question. Um, I think I have changed a lot. Yeah, I think. Um, um, yeah, I think. I mean, I had had I think addiction issues since I was kind of fourteen. So that meant that um, uh, my transition into adulthood. It was almost like when I went into recovery at twenty seven. It was like being a child again. So. Um, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but um, it felt like a really big thing, a big deal. So um, uh, I think I'm better at looking after myself, probably better at knowing um, how to, what to, to do that's healthy um, rather than not, you know, masochistic or so on. Um, and I, I guess I probably, uh, after, since those dark days, um, like the state of, active addiction um it's very self-focused and well for me was it was anyway and you're constantly just thinking obsessively about the next fix whatever um whereas plugging into to nature and kind of falling in love with nature again and i i don't know about using the word nature like that but you know what i mean you know the rest of the living world um has just expanded my 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 mind, my world, and you know I'm so uh, it's so clear to me that I'm just scratching the surface. Um, you know that I feel very lucky to be curious, and and that if you love 
if you love the living world that it there's not an end to it um you know there's always more to see and there's always more to experience like in the last year i've got really into um fungi and i mean you could spend your whole life searching for awesome and wonderful mushrooms um it feels like a really good way to kind of spend my time and also to kind of bring my children up in in trying to give them those that chance to have that kinship um kind of personally from a you know quite self-involved level that I love it but also because I think it's important um you know we have a dysfunctional relationship with the earth at the moment you know in our society and uh that seems very important considering what's what's happening with the climate and um you know, biodiversity collapse and so on it seems um like there couldn't be it, it seems very central to me to understanding and living life and to try and understand how to be a better human how to be a good human on earth okay my next question is going to be a very tough one for you you ready mm -hmm. what's your favorite fun guy <laughs> um okay the one i'm really into is because um, I was searching for it for ages and I just found it like a month ago. The Turk, I think it's called the Green Elf Cup, but it should be called Turquoise Elf Cup because it's 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 actually the colour of. Uh, I promise this wasn't a plug, <laughs> but it is it is the colour of the leaves on my book, which I love that colour because it's quite uncanny and eerie. Um, anyway, yeah, so they're just little um, kind of cups and. And what I love about them is the colour. So it's so strange and unusual to see something bright turquoise in the woods. And I'd always kind of seen photos and wanted to see them. And I thought, ah, you know, you never see anything blue. But but yeah, I'm really into these these guys. It feels like you're in Fern Gully or, you know, some kind of psychedelic film. I really love them. <laughs> Fantastic. And if you could be anywhere on this planet, notwithstanding this horrible pandemic and all restrictions, where would you be right now? Um, I, I, I was going to first say Venice because I love Venice so much. And, you know, you're the urban birdist, so I feel like I should say something. I'm in. But I really miss the sea. And my mum lives in Galloway in Scotland, which is a really wild. It's kind of my spiritual home. And um, I would just love to be there I would just love to see the sea um and walk in the woods um they've got amazing we've always got kind of I always see curlews and oyster catchers uh red shanks um and there's an owl yeah it's it, it feels like coming home when I'm when I go there fantastic okay well um we've come to the part of the evening where um we will part company, but before I do that, I just want to tell all the Zoomers in the room of more people coming up on the In Conservation With roster. Um, on Thursday this week, we've got a guy called Graham Appleton, who may not be known to anyone, but he's doing some great work talking about waders or shorebirds. Um, they are a cause for concern in terms of their rapid decline. Um, next week, um, we have on Monday the 15th, um, a young lady called Ruth Weaver, who um, basically has used the pandemic to launch, to launch a fairly successful career so far as an artist. Um, and she's a great uh, bird artist. So she'll be um, doing some work in front of us um, next Monday. Uh, on the Thursday, we've got a young, another young lady called Kirsty Franklin. Again, not a household name, but she's doing some really good work with petrels and shearwaters in Mauritius. Not, she's not there. She's actually at home in England somewhere. But she's doing some virtual bird counting and she wants us to get involved. So she's going to tell us all about how to get involved in counting birds virtually. Um, and then on Monday, the 1st of March, we have a young, another young lady here on In Conservation With. We talk to loads of women. We talk to ethnically diverse people and maybe a couple of men as well. Um, anyway, on Monday, the 1st of March, we've got Alice Tribe um, and she um, works with BirdLife Malta. She's in Malta now and she's going to talk to us about raptor perse persecution and general hunting. 
so that should be an interesting evening but um so that's all lined up so please you know come along and and uh, listen in on and view in as well um lucy um thank you so much you are a very inspirational woman your book's great by the way and if you want to get it guys it's out on paperback in a couple of weeks time but it was really a pleasure talking to you tonight i'm really so happy you said yes to this um i've learned a lot and i'll be learning more once i finish the book but thank you so much thank you so much for your great questions and it was such um an honor and pleasure to feature and and be here tonight thank you it was really interesting to chat to you thank you very much lucy and thank you zoomers you know the deal take care of yourself and don't forget to keep looking up <laughs>